2 Timothy. Uh, we'll be picking up in uh, chapter 3, beginning verses 1 through 9 today. And so if you got your Bible and you're digging that out, I'll, I'll let you uh, continue to look for that. Uh, just to uh, touch on one, uh, two announcements that uh, have been put before you already, but uh, this Friday is the uh, first distribution of the community food pantry from TriPoint Church of God. It is the food pantry that had been served through St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church. Uh, sadly, they have had to close their doors and along with it, their food pantry, so uh, it has been moved here. I want to thank everybody that came out last Wednesday to help move that in the pouring rain. How about that? Ten days of sunshine and the one day we move, it's pouring rain, but uh, it worked out well. Um, we had the help from the Charlton Heston Academy uh, National Honor Society students, and uh, so they did all the work. We just stood around and uh, let them figure it out. Um, appreciate uh, Sandy showing up and taking photographs of that and just everything. So it is set up and we're ready to go. Uh, we need volunteers. Uh, several people have expressed an interest to be a part of that. Um, that again this Friday from noon till two. Um, it's going to take you know probably a dozen people to make it function as it has, and uh, so we're just looking for that to uh, continue here. And then next Sunday, right after service, is our annual church business meeting. That's the all-church business meeting. Uh, we need you here if you're a member of the church because we uh, need to have a quorum to conduct the business meeting. And this is the, the meeting where we set the budget, elect our uh, um, board of directors and our uh, election committee members uh, for the next year. And so it's an imperative that you're here for that and that we, we make that happen. Um, by, uh, real quick, the... Packets have been put together. I uh, thank Shelly for all the work that she put into getting those together. They've been sent out online. If you haven't received yours yet, there are hard copies available back at the Connect Center. Um, there's a sample ballot in there of, of who the candidates are. Uh, I want to introduce uh, real quick, uh, I didn't tell them I was going to do this, uh, but who is running for your board positions, uh, just in case you don't know who they are. And if you have any questions for them, uh, feel free to, to collar them right after service. Again, totally on the spot. They didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, Sam Gingrich is uh, currently serving as the chair. His term expires, and he's eligible to run a second term, and he has uh, agreed to do that. He's sitting right up front here, if you don't know Sam. Uh, Michael Relicki, um, he's probably got his kids out front there. Um, if you don't know who he is, uh, just get with me. I'll collar him for you and let you know. Uh, Jerry Hensberger. If anybody comes in through this door, typically you would know who Jerry is. Um, he has agreed to run for a board position as well. And uh, he is not here today, just recovering from sh shoulder surgery. I have to say it like that or it gets all slurred together. Um, so, and then we have uh, Fred Denman. He's agreed to uh, fill in for a, 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 a vacancy this year and has uh, agreed to run for a, a term again. And so he'll be there and... Is that five? I forgot to keep count. One, two. Toby Dome over here is the uh, fifth person that's running. Um, and so, again, they'll be at the back uh, right after service if you want to meet with them and just uh, get a little bit of their testimony and, and what, what uh, their desires are for TriPoint Church of God. Second Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. But know this, difficult times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid these people." For among them are those who worm their way into households and capture idle people burdened with sin, led along by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth, men who are corrupt in mind, worthless in regard of the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their lack of understanding will be clear to all, as theirs was also. Paul takes time in this last uh, letter to Timothy to just give him a, a brief warning. The real uh, nuts and bolts of it is this. Realize or come to know. Be aware that there can be a problem and avoid it. 
There's a danger of the empty religion that permeates in our culture and in our churches today. And Paul's warning Timothy about this. He says that in the last days, difficult times will come. The Greek word for difficult that he uses here really just means harsh or fierce or savage. And when he talks about last days, what he's referring to is the church age. That period of time from the ascension of Christ until the return of Christ. The church age. All of that is the last times. Period from when he left until he, he will come back. Times always means seasons or a time period. And in that period... The church will experience some problems, some difficulties. Sometimes more intense than others, but always something creeping up. If we don't learn anything from Paul's writings or, or the New Testament letters, is that the, the church, even at the beginning, had its problems. And Paul was constantly addressing that. And here he describes in detail the kind of evil men who will instigate trouble and opposition within the church. And he's not just he's prophesying about some future date. He's actually speaking in the present tense. If you look at verses uh, 6 and 8, he talks about things that are presently happening, happening in his time. We can see them happening in our time as well because it's all the end times and the same problems they had, we have. But the long list of evil evil characteristics are not about godless persons people who don't go to church or people who have nothing to do with with the religion at all in verse 5 he says they hold a form of godliness but deny its power he's talking about the people who are in the church those who are professing a faith in God and Christ but it's an empty religion. It's just a hollow shell. They lack the reality of a genuine relationship with God. A God who looks on the heart of the individual. A God who knows you intimately. A God who is with you in the midst of your struggles. A God who is aware of what's going on in your mind and in your life and, and what happens in your life behind closed doors. And it's real easy to read this passage and start casting judgment on, on other people and say, yeah, I know somebody like that. I've seen this person do that and that person do this. But ultimately, the question of all Scripture comes down to what does it mean to me? And like the disciples at the Last Supper with Christ, when he said that one of you will betray me, they began to ask, is it I? We read passages like this. We need to direct that toward ourselves. Is it I? Do I have a form of godliness but deny the true power of Christ in my life? Paul's message is that we must knowingly avoid empty religion and those people that spread it. He makes four points out of this. First is that empty religion is a constant danger. It's a reality. It exists. We can't pretend that it doesn't. And it's easy to fall into a trap of outwardly professing one thing and inwardly living a different way. Character is ultimately defined by what you do when nobody is watching and nobody will find out. And too many times in our life we feel that we can wear a mask and put on a front and present uh, ourselves as one way and behind the closed doors or in the reality we're a totally different character. That's what that word hypocrite really means. It means to wear a mask, to be on stage pretending to be something that you're not. And if you wonder why so many people who are not believers look on the church and say, man, that's filled with a bunch of hypocrites, it's because many churches are filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And the trick is to make sure that I am not one of them, that you are not one of them, that we are, our faith is genuine and that we are living out what we profess to believe. Paul says this empty religion uh, makes itself known in several different ways. First of all, empty religion uh, has a form without the power. It results in 
you judging yourself, practicing the act of constant communion, it's been referred to, where each moment of my day, I'm, I'm checking myself against what God's word says. Am I living right right now? Confessing those areas where I have shortcomings in my life before God. Examining continually what my true intentions are and what my desire is. The problem of empty religion comes from a misplacing of our affections. Jesus said that where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. What you desire is, is what is important to you. It's significant that the first two things on his character list that, that Paul talks about is the, they will be lovers of self, they'll be lovers of money, and then he bookends it with they will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The empty religion he's talking about are people who are lovers of themselves. They're the, the, and it leads you to a, a, a list of all these other things. Jesus said there's two great commandments. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And love your neighbor as yourself. Self-love is the, the assumed standard by which we would look on everybody else. We would, we would love everybody else as much as we desire to have all of the things in our life. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, the first requirement is to deny yourself. Quit worrying about what's going to be yours and start worrying about what everybody else is going to have and how you can help them. There's all kinds of verses in the Bible that command us to be humble. They command us to not think too highly of ourselves. But there are no verses that tell us that we need to love ourselves more than we already do. Scripture tells us to esteem ourselves more highly than we already do, right? No, it doesn't. It tells us that just how you love yourself, be loving others. But those with empty religion are lovers of money. And that flows out of the self-love. If we love ourselves, then we love money because then we can buy the things that we want to be comfortable and have a nice lifestyle. And while it is a biblical command, command that husbands provide for their family, there's a danger in loving money too much because those who want to get rich for in first Timothy Paul says will fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge, plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs Where your affection is, Jesus said, that's where your treasure is. What it is that you care about in this world will show the character that you have. And those with empty religion are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. If that doesn't describe our culture today, I don't know what does. And it describes many of our churches as well. That we're lovers of pleasure, that we're always seeking the fun thing. There's a new uh, faith-based movie uh, come out here within the last year or so called Church People. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's a pretty funny uh, uh, movie. But uh, in it, it's a mega church that uh, has kind of lost their way, and there's a youth pastor in there that, that's uh, kind of got caught up in the lifestyle. And so the church, it's hilarious because every Sunday they got something different going on, and it's all about a show. There's there's light shows, and, and, and one particular Sunday morning they got uh, BMX bikes in the background doing loop-de-loops as, as the preacher's trying to preach and stuff. And, but the church has gotten into it. It's only funny because it's based in reality. If you watch some of these uh, mega churches and the, the theatrics that they put on, it's all about entertainment. It's all about amusing the individual. It's not about presenting the gospel. 
So Paul shows us that empty religion, religion means having a form of religion but no power. And that it's that, those misdirected affections of love of self, love of money, and love of pleasure that leads to the, the, the rest of this character list, list of, of defects. Those with empty religion are boastful, he says. Bragging about what they can do. All of the things that they can accomplish. All of the things that I've done. I've done that, and, and I made this happen, and I made that happen. And, and it's all the, the I, I, I of the I world that we live in. Spending time patting themselves on the back, and then it leads to that next one, arrogance. Because they start to believe their own boasting of all that they have accomplished on their own and all that they're capable of doing. And so that inward attitude says that, that they're better than others. And so that leads them to be, being re revilers, that the, the boastfulness and the arrogance within them has, leads it to insulting others now. He says those with empty religion are disobedient to their parents. Why did he throw that in there? Well, because the, the parental guidance of the home, the, the model that Christ has instituted of the family is supposed to be a reflection of God's authority. And Satan works overtime to undermine Christian homes so that he can undermine that authority, that parental authority, thereby undermining godly authority in everybody's life. And so they're disobedient of parents. They, they negate what authority is over them. And they're ungrateful. They're ungrateful towards God and what he has done for them. The atonement of their sin and the reconciliation of each of us to, to God so that we are made right in a right relationship with him. And they're ungrateful toward others. Any gratefulness stems from a, a realization that you're an undeserving recipient of God's grace and of other people's grace. When you come to realize with a humble attitude that what people do for you is not because it's something you earn or something you deserve or something that, that was your due, but it was grace. It was an unmerited favor that God has poured out on you and I. And when we share those types of things with other people, it becomes a reflection of that grace. I've been a recipient of a whole bunch of grace this pastor appreciation month. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm ready to cry uncle. <laughs> it's been very, very humbling. Um, it's been very amazing. The outpouring of love and support. I, I don't think you guys missed a day that I didn't get a card or an email, a phone call, a, a text, a, a word of encouragement and embrace. Empty religion is ungrateful. And I, I would never be able to stand up here and just express all of the gratitude that I have for the appreciation and love that you have poured out for me. Empty religion, Paul says, are people who are unholy. They have no fear of God before their eyes. They live as, as what is right for them, and they're not set apart in any way. There's no difference between them and the world, and they're unloving. Their self-centeredness leaves them incapable of even understanding that there's other people in the world, let alone that they have needs as great or greater than what yours are. They're irreconcilable. They refuse to seek forgiveness when they're wrong. Again, that haughty spirit that tells them that, that I have been wrong, not I am wrong, and to admit that, they, that they've made mistakes or that they've hurt people and an unwillingness to give forgiveness to somebody who may have wronged them. They hold a grudge and they seek out, seek out ways to, to get their revenge on people. They refuse to be reconciled. They live in a world of turmoil where reconciliation is, is shut out. They're malicious gossips. They have no self-control. They're brutes. They're haters of good. They're treacherous and they're reckless and they're conceited. And remember that Paul isn't talking about atheists or non-believers or people from outside of the church. He's talking about people that are in the church. 
They do not have a right relationship with God in themselves, and so they live out ways that are contrary to what their religion says. And it's important that we continue to take inventory of ourselves, that we don't fall into that trap. Because empty religion is a real danger, but empty religion also always has those who are ready to spread it. It's interesting that they're not content to just have their own empty religion, but they, like a worm, creep their way into households and captivate people that are idle or sinful or lustful. Purveyors of false religion often prey on people that have emotional or spiritual needs. People who are wrongfully burdened with a bunch of guilt and shame that they could easily turn over to Christ and, and, and be able to walk away from. But they prey on them. Satan likes to use those shortcomings as an opportunity to bring about guilt on people so that they can spread the empty religion. They prey on people who have a desire for learning. Now, learning is not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with education. Um, I say it all the time. I never took my academic pursuits very seriously because I didn't. They were just things I had to do to get to the next thing that I wanted to do. But Paul says these people who are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth are a danger. The knowledge of truth that he's talking about is the knowledge of Christ. That there is a reconciliation for the life that we live and that there is a way to repent and to turn away from a certain lifestyle and turn to what God has called us to be. And those that spread the empty religion do so by oppo opposing a truth with counterfeit results. And so Paul talks about this point. He says, just as the Egyptian musicians, that's what he's talking about with the, the Jambres and the uh, Janus characters. Uh, Jewish tradition tells us that they are the uh, magicians in Pharaoh's court who, when Moses threw down his staff and it became a snake, they, they mimicked those uh, signs of power. And so Paul is saying, just like they did with false signs of Power. There are people in the church today who will bring about things that, that make it look like God is working or moving in some way. But it's not the truth. It's a counterfeit. It's a fake. Once again, it's that hypocrisy. Empty religion is a constant danger for us to be aware of. Empty religion is always spread by people within the church and Empty religion is something that we need to knowingly avoid. In verse 1, Paul says, realize or know this. Come to know. Be aware. And in verse 5, he says, avoid such men. We need to know in advance that things can happen so that we're not caught off guard, so that we're not unaware of this. Knowledge is power, they say. And so when you see professing Christians and Christian churches that, that are pursuing self-love and love of money and love of pleasures, be aware of it. Don't be taken in. But rather, avoid it. Turn away from it. And lastly, he says that empty religion will ultimately not triumph. In verse 9, he says, but they will, make, they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus's and Jambres was. Paul doesn't mean that they're just going to cease to exist or cease to, to thwart the church, but there is a limit to what God will allow them to do. But the only antidote for this evil that creeps into the church is Jesus Christ and the power of God and His word of truth in our lives. So many things exist to distort what the good news says. And they'll take a little piece of scripture and they'll twist it and bend it and meld it into a way that is palatable for people today. And next week as we continue this, we're going to look at that idea 
of how they want to twist and move Scripture around. But know this, that Christ is the way. Christ is the truth, and Christ is the life everlasting. And it's in and through that reality that we become a faithful church when we surrender ourselves and our lives to his rule, his reign, his authority, that is genuine faith, genuine religion that bears fruit. Be careful of what you listen to, what you take in, and how you allow the true words of God to be twisted and manipulated and massaged so that it's just palatable for those that are lovers of self and lovers of pleasure rather than those that are lovers of God. God calls us to be a pure and holy people set apart for his good works that we can be empowered to change the face of the world that we live in. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we do come before you again today so thankful that your word lives and breathes in us and that we can know your face, your heart, and your desires for each one of us. Strengthen us as always, Lord, to be your faithful servants, to walk with a true face of your reflection, that all may come to know who you are and the great love that you hold forth for all people. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.